On behalf of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies and the UE's Research Days, we welcome everyone. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to host this forum and welcome your participation in talking about this relevant topic national of national importance during the 20th anniversary of UE's Research Days. We acknowledge our panel, Minister Chang, who um, everyone has been drawn into the excitement of research days uh, on arrival, uh, visiting some of the exhibits, Min Minister Chang, Mr. Peter Bunting, Dr. Dacia Leslie, Chair of the Crime Prevention and Offender Management Cluster, Rear Admiral Hardly Lewin, Commissioner Terence Williams, Mr. Horace Re Levy, and Dr. Herbert Gale. Acknowledging here, we have our principal, Professor Dale Weber, our university director, Professor Aldry Henry Lee, the director of grad studies and research and the chair of UE's research days, Professor Denise Eldemeyer Shero, our dean, Professor David Tennant, Mr. Bruno Puiza, resident coordinator of the United Nations system, and several representatives uh, from media, from the diaspora, and we welcome you all and thank you very much for being here. And the discussions have already started behind us, as you can hear. So we're now going to go into We also welcome Prof. Anthony Clayton, who has joined us. Okay. A little bit about the Crime Prevention and Offender Management Cluster. It is one of the research clusters of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute, and it's chaired by Dr. Dacia Leslie, who has put this excellent panel together. It's also part of the Researcher Spotlight series of our Salises Research Fellows. We are partnering as well with the Crime, Security, and Justice Cluster of the University of the West Indies, which Professor Dale Weber, uh, in his role as Pro-Vice Chancellor for Grad Studies and Research, had formed and is part of the One UE Initiative. So we're very pleased with all of the linkages that we have here on this panel today. We also welcome the We Transform booth, which is an initiative of the Ministry of National Security. And also we're collaborating with UNICEF U Report, which is also a youth initiative. We're going to go into the introductions of our panelists and then the presentations will proceed. Minister Chang has been with us over several research days. Last year, as part of UE70 celebration, sharing with us his role as Gill president. Uh, former Gill president, and also in previous years, uh, giving us calls to action related to the research agenda for the university. Dr. Horace Chang, a medical doctor by profession, began his political career in 1976 as an active member of the JLP and presently serves as general secretary for the party. Dr. Chang has been a member of parliament for Northwest St. James since 2002 and served as opposition spokesman on housing and inner city development, as well as water and housing. He served as Minister Without Portfolio with responsibility for water, works, and housing in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation from February 2016 to March 2018, and is currently the Minister of National Security. And we welcome Minister Chan. We also take the opportunity to welcome our Director of Public Prosecutions, Paula Llewellyn. <laughs> Mr. Peter Bunting, former Minister of National Security and Shadow Minister of Industry, Investment and Competitiveness. Peter Bunting is a four-term MP who represents Central Manchester. 
He has worked to transform that constituency into a center of excellence for the knowledge-based industries, primarily through the development of the education, healthcare, and ICT BPO sectors. As a former Minister of National Security, he forged a strategic partnership between the citizenry and security forces based on his conviction, and this is related to strong beliefs, that a public safety policy must balance social intervention and policing efforts to ensure effectiveness and sustainability. He has chaired a variety of parliamentary committees and is currently the opposition spokesman on industry, investment, and competitiveness. As General Secretary of the People's National Party, Mr. Bunting was campaign manager for the general and local government election campaigns in 2011 and 2012 respectively, which resulted in, quote, landslide victories for the party. Mr. Bunting successfully co-founded a number of successful financial institutions, including Manufacturers Merchant Bank, Daring Bunting Golding, and Proven Investments Limited. So, so we're going to proceed with 15-minute opening addresses from our Minister of National Security and the former Minister of National Security. And then we will invite the panelists to respond um, in relation to the five pillar strategy. And I will do the introductions of the panel members at that time. So we invite Minister Chang. Thank you. I think our chairperson, Madam Ms. Bailey, the, my colleague, member of parliament, Mr. Bunting, and this distinguished panel, Professor Clayton, Ms. Llewellyn, Mr. Admiral Hartley Llewellyn, Mr. Williams, Mr. Levy, Dr. Gale, and Ms. Leslie, and of course, this fantastic audience. It's my privilege and pleasure to join this team to discuss what is one of the most critical issues facing the country and it has been a front page topic for, for many, many years. That crime has been spoken of from as long as I can remember. Um, even on campus, which is some time ago. But I'm also a little bit concerned with the topic we have chosen. A few slides we want to show. In the sense, revisiting Jamaica's crime plan. Because from a public point of view, I've never seen a publicly announced crime plan in the history of the country. Planning for the particular process. I'm sure the police may have had some plan in their execution. But planning for the particular process, in my view, and although I did meds, I think I understand a little bit of what planning should be. It involves researching the topic, identifying the problems you have, and then looking for what would be the public investment required to resolve those problems. And then you find within your resources, the budget required to do so, set out a schedule of implementation and proceed to execute the plan. Now, I've never seen that done for crime or any anti-crime in Jamaica as a plan. First of all, I've never seen a budget that suggests we're investing in anything in our security architecture. And that, to me, is the first thing we do. We have had some very good reviews. In fact, Professor Clayton, you have done some extended work with some of the more common sense suggestions for preparing our security forces to deal with crime. I don't think any of them have ever been executed. Yes, you may speak on it later. And some of them were basic common sense opinion. So that's really where I want to start. And while I cannot articulate fully a plan tonight, I'd say we have spent some time and developed not a crime plan because it's a subset of any security plan for the country. And the government has engaged professionals and have designed a, what the Prime Minister of Articulate has planned secure Jamaica, I will indicate some of the things we intend to do in this. In starting and sticking to my time, I thought I'd look quickly at some of the situations we're dealing with. The first slide, I think, deals with just statistics. We can go too quickly. We have them. Um, well, I had a slide showing the situation of murder rate over the last starting from 2002, which is roughly 16 years, first in Jamaica and then in Montego Bay, which shows essentially a continuing rise. There was a dip after the 2010 state of emergency in both places, although it was in Kingston, 
But since then, they came back and the rebound was much higher, which is something that um, could have been anticipated. And if sometime I get a little bit tested when I speak on crime, that is something that was a common sense issue. I remember saying that, giving that, that presentation in Montego Bay, very early in my time as a politician in Montego Bay. That Montego Bay had gang wars between the different districts. So, Hart Street fights with Barnet Lane, um, Bottom Pen fight with the Hendon, Rose Heights, Tank Top, Green Tank fight with Bottom Water. They can't deal like that year after year. I said, one day, look, one day they're going to come together in alliance and the whole town going to have a big crime problem because you're going to have this group alive with that group. And indeed, by the early 2000s, we had the emergence of one gang called Stone Crusher, which is a massive group of young men fighting another group. And we had murder rate moving from under 50 to over 200. It was not something that we had to wait to happen. It was easy to predict. Nobody did anything about it. In fact, in trying to create some alternative diversion for the young people, it took me 10 years to build one training center. And it got no private sector support. Absolutely no private sector support except from one company. And therefore, I take discussion from the private sector with a grain of salt every time I hear the comment. I'm sorry. That's my experience that I have had. The context in which I'd like to put my short presentation is one, and I go back to my opening comments though, is the first big issue in my opinion is not planning and, well, planning is the issue, but is that the country has failed to invest substantially in security since independence. And the result of that is that I inherit a very degraded security apparatus which could do nothing of the things that we have asked them to do. They were not physically prepared for it. Um, they were not prepared for it. We have brought in legislation for rights. We have given them oversight from police oversight committee in the Comor kind of thing. But we really were being very unfair to the police force. The police force, the same young Jamaicans that come to university, join the police force, live in the community. And what I mean is, they have 186 police stations. They are all dilapidated and run down. You go to Savlamar, and the CIB detective side of it is sitting, is based on a veranda in an old building in which they move the tea around, the, the chairs and the tables around to avoid dropping through the holes on the veranda. Westman has one of the highest murder rates in the island. They have a set of, the police vehicle fleet comprised about 16 different brands. Anybody who understands vehicles knows it's almost impossible to maintain them in any good order, so they have less than a thousand operations at any time, even they have a thousand vehicles on the books. Um, if we go into the communication at once, the police communication system, which is critical to crime fighting, is degraded and hardly work, and does not work across the island. And if you think of modern police and the use of technology to expand and give a force multiplier effect, they are still very primitive. And I might comment on the incident that has been circulating only less since yesterday on TV, and of course, there's pros and cons. The police officer shot a gentleman. Well, there was some people feel it was wrong over use of excessive force. And there are people say, well, the man jumped in him chest, which is true, and he had to respond. The lesson for me from that, take a look. You have an under-equipped police officer on the road. It is common sense if you assign a police officer to work in the public space, which we will be doing with the public public space, sorry, at the PSTB branch, public safety and traffic enforcement branch, they should be equipped with more equipment. You give them a sidearm. If a man jumps in him, chase him or shoot him. He doesn't need to defend himself. A modern police officer should have at least a taser, pepper spray or similar equipment, a button, a camera, all these are things you should have had on him. A, the camera to ensure he can monitor what's happening. So he's aware he's being monitored. When he finishes the operation, he'll look again to look what he might have done wrong or right. Develop best practices to interface the public. And of course, if he was trained properly and has the other equipment, he would maybe use a taser or a pepper spray before he resorts to a firearm. He does not have the equipment. He cannot do otherwise. Officers who are going to deal with areas where we have aggressive crowds, such as areas where um, bus stop parks, vendors should be properly equipped, have on the vest with the numbers, etc. That's just to be common sense. So that to have effective policing, we have to deal with that. We, of course, also had 
in the face of a rising murder rate, there was, a, there was no focus on the strategic development of the police force. Each time we have a problem, the murder rate spike, we create a new operational plan. So we had plans like Operation Dovetail, Operation Kingfish, Operation Added, Operation Resilience, and all kind of plans, some of them named, some unnamed, and special squads. And there's rarely, at no time, how we sat down and looked, what kind of police force does Jamaica need, what investment does it require, and we set about in a systematic way to proceed in that direction. We have never sought to institutionalize community policing, and in fact, social and community intervention, we have spent billions of dollars. Because of lack of proper planning and coordination, it has not been as successful as it should be. The lack of equipment and resources is critical. So, I notice, of course, before I proceed beyond that, the topic referred to and the documentation I get want to look at the five pillar strategy. And let me emphasize that the strategy and maybe more better put is a philosophical framework. And I won't be spending a lot of time on, the, on it. If you have questions, you may ask. But there are common sense generic principles for security, effective policing. And I will speak to that because that's where we need planning. Swift and short justice in the process. The courthouse in Jamaica, I take you. Well, I don't even, I don't go that. It's not my portfolio, but it doesn't work in the interest of the wider um, issue. We have a new Chief Justice, who I know is working assiduously to bring it online, and we have put some investment in that area as well. Social development, I indicate, is a critical part of it, but the coordination of social development has been poor. In addition to that, everybody who spends some money on social development want their own, their own stripe, their own silo. The government has taken some steps to try and deal with that with the broadening role of JCF HOPE and to put everything into one space. But that has been a big problem at one stage. I think one commissioner did a review and there are about 75 different social intervention programs operating simultaneously in Jamaica along with what I call the core activities of education, social development commission and others. We have to correct that. Situation crime prevention includes the use of technology and so forth to in expand the capacity of the force and rehabilitation and redemption provides again a basis for discussion in correctional service. <clears throat> so that, that really is my comment on the five point because it's a policy that's really. In terms of where we're going, as a government we have taken time to look at the problem and where we will articulate a plan. As I said, we're not going to articulate another operational plan. I've indicated that on the social side, the government is concentrating its social services to give, to get a better bang for the buck. Simple, for example, just take literacy, we have merged heart, the, what was in Jamal Long Life, life the, the anti-literacy program, along with a number of youth services into one body. And HOPE, of course, has an overarching coordination activity in all the youth services we are providing, and we expect to get much be more benefit out of that. The, including the National Service Corps, which is administered by the Jamaica Defense Force, and all the training facilities. But the most critical element, in my view, is still to find, within our budget, the money to invest when we plan. We have gone out and got experts to look at the various sectors, and the Prime Minister, I can articulate that much. We are looking at three critical areas. Border security is critical. The fact is that we cannot speak about reducing the flow of arms in the country, and we have no way of protecting our borders. Again, a common sense activity. We had a depleted Coast Guard, Ocean Patrol, was a half vessel, it was old and dilapidated. And we have set about to build out at least a new brigade in the JDF, the Marine, Air, and Cybersecurity team, led by an extremely competent lady, Commander Gorman who will get the resources to deal with border security as well as to relook at our customs and passport immigration division at the illegal ports. I mentioned that again to show what is not just a plan, but we have to do the budget. It's going to cost a whole heap of money. We have spent a fair amount. We have a marine patrol aircraft which costs us 36 million US. Some months say could have built open roads, but if we're going to control the crime rate, and control the flow of guns in this country, which come from Haiti, down the islands, Costa Rica, and the United States. We don't manufacture any. And our 
criminal leaders are extremely competent in the international trade and transnational organization that functioning. We will put in coastal radars and other activity, other programs. They now have two operating ocean-going patrol boats, and we need more. And we're going to have an effective border patrol security by the end of, the, not this year, within the, within another 24 months. But we have something that's working now, and that's why if we look at a plan, we look at what it going to cost, and can the country afford it, and, and can we afford not to afford it? We are looking at cyber security. I'm going to that because we need to keep the country on the front line of this criminal activity. And of course, we have to look at our police now in terms of efficient policing, what do they need? The police has been the most neglected sector of the security element, and they are the ones who are the prime, fight, prime defenders of public safety. As I indicated before, all the police stations are in wreck. We are, in fact, serious about repairing all of them and we're building several new ones. We have had three going in East, I think Port Antonio, Port Maria, and Buff Bay is being rebuilt. There are another eight, I can't name them, in the smaller stations. We're going to do Sablama, Spanish Town. And in fact, we're going to rebuild about 20 stations and repair the rest of it. It's going to cost a lot of money to do so. It cannot be done otherwise. But the policemen must have physical space that they feel comfortable working in. The condition in which police officers work, most people in this room, they get a job there, unless they're a police officer now, would have walked out a long time ago. That's a plain fact of life, and yet we demand what we do. After, and uh, we did a, a little study in which somebody looked at police stations and the output, not only in terms of the physical state, but then of course the professionalism of the police in terms of responsive attentiveness, and find that performance was far more impressive where they had a good station and the policemen could focus on effective policemen. Very direct empirical connection. In addition to that, they are, their mobility is extremely limited. The cars are old, run down, and problematic. We are refleeting the police force. This year we have bought 150 new vehicles, and next year we'll buy maybe another 400, depending on the price we get, new vehicles, and we look toward refleeting the entire police force and introduce a proper fleet management system. One that gives the police knowledge of where the police vehicles are, how they're operating, and one that ensures there's a routine maintenance that is in place and that is effective. That was not in place in the police force. The communication system needs to be rebuilt. It will cost a lot of money. It will be announced in the budget, but we're talking a couple billion dollars to, in fact, outfit the police with an effective radar network. Simple, basic police equipment. The policemen we are putting on various sectors, both geographical and non-geographical divisions. We expect to be trained properly for the areas and given the appropriate equipment. I alluded to that with the public, public safety and transport, transportation enhancement branch we have established, which is doing very well. They have been trained in the area how to interact with the public, and we are going to provide them the equipment they require. The cameras, non-lethal equipment, they still have their arm. Jamaica has a high murder rate, and we need a police force that can defend themselves effectively while defending the community. But the areas of specialists will have their specialized equipment. The technology will also be expanded to deal with increasing force, to be a force multiplier. So Jamaica I and other programs of that sort will be expanded and settled during the course of this year. The human resource development will not only involve equipment and training, but we look at a new promotional system, and I'll end on that note, because the police force is one of the most, well, it, it has never been efficiently organized. It has huge non-geographical divisions, and it has geographical divisions out there, 19 of them, but promotional has been very opaque. The commission have introduced a system that we create a matrix of an exam that everybody must do, their annual performance, their length of service, and of course, they are vetted to see that they have the integrity. And if they are going to officer court, they are interviewed by the senior officer, the commissioner and his team. And if each area is given a weight, which can be criticized, reviewed, but when it's done, every officer can look on the score. This year, I can tell you that because of the number of spaces that were being filled, the pass mark was above 67. That was the reality. So we are creating that kind of atmosphere. Finally, I'd like to indicate in terms of development, 
we are looking at not only fixing the station but rationalizing the station because part of what we would like to do, we will do. And each thing I speak of, there's a budget behind it, and I'm not going to anticipate what is coming, tell you what's coming in the budget. But each year has a cost factor, and that's the only way I can judge a plan. We are going to rationalize stations too. In the carpet area, we have maybe 5,000 policemen. They are scattered over about 40 places. They cost us nearly 4 million US a year for rent. We intend to correct that problem and have a central police facility that will host them. It will cost a lot of money, but what we are paying in rent now will recover at a very rapid rate. And it could go a long way in assisting not only improving efficiency, but make a major contribution to the renewal of Kingston, the carpet area. And I will say more that another time. We intend to look to at laying out standards for all the stations. And I close on that note, say for example, a small station in rural Jamaica which have 30 police officers should have certain minimum equipment. I mentioned communication, mobility, but say in mobility, I mention it because the, we have used these areas almost as scarce benefits in, tradi in the traditional way. You have MPs asking the minister for a car, the community writing out a car, somebody begging a car and selling, giving the police station. And we're not accepting any of those, by the way. That's the policy. If you give a car to a police station, we're not taking it, send it to the head commissioner's office. A motor vehicle is a very important operational tool, and the assignment is the responsibility of the commissioner, not anybody else. Secondly, gifts will corrupt. And people who give gifts expect special responses, so no gifts are being accepted in the police station. If we want security, we must pay for it. And what we pay is what we'll get. Now, when I'm just saying that in Clonet Nord, we intend to establish minimum standards that we'd like to see. So a station out in K Valley should have three motor vehicles. Now they might have none. They should have one for regular patrol, one for special operations, one for the CIB. When that standard is laid, then every community can look at what they require, what they are short of. And if the commissioner wants to reassign, you know what we have reassigned and what should go back. Thought I'd go along my presentation at this line because I wanted to give an indication that the government is planning and we'll articulate it more properly as we go into parliament and as we establish budget. But in planning, we're not only taking a philosophy or looking at good reviews, we are looking at what it will cost to do it. Because unless we articulate the cost, and establish that in a schedule, how we're going to do it, and also produce that procurement efficiently, we'll not get anywhere. But it's a commitment to invest in our security forces, give this country a police force, an army which supports it, and MOCA, which is part of the new architecture, a security team that will be able to provide the public with safe public spaces, safety in their homes, to provide the kind of support for our territorial waters required to exploit our blue economy, to protect our borders and keep out the guns that are killing our people. And in final comment, that is the plan, that's the philosophy, and that's the approach. There will be a debate and question about the state of public emergency. We maintain we still need a tool in the box because the investment we are making will take time to bear fruit. We are not doing this slowly. We expect by next year begin to see impact, impact. I give myself two years to have full impact where we can bring homicide rate to years we can accept under 400 in the country. But in the meantime, people are being killed. We need a tool of the special enhanced powers which gives three things that you don't get outside of. It. State of public emergency give, allows us to use the army as a force multiplier, which is important. Secondly, it allows us to separate the killers from the community. Whatever anybody wants to say, the police are sweeping young men off the road. We take up people based on intelligence. Everybody knows every shot in the community. Right? And not compromising with them. They must come off the streets. And finally, the application of special powers given to the security forces expresses a national will that we will confront the criminals. Because if we fail to do that, then those who are leading the criminal in the world take advantage of that psychological gap. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to try and quickly 
go through some slides I have here, and I hope everybody can see the uh, one of the screens because I'm going to rely quite heavily on it. Um, but just moving forward, um, the <clears throat> it, interestingly, it's like I knew what Horace was going to end at the state of emergency, or what's on the slide as a SOE. The SOE is not a plan or a tool, but we will see as we go on. So first of all, a, a, a plan is a list of steps taken to accomplish a goal. The who, what, when, where, how. Uh, most of what, and, and I agree with Horace, that most of what the mini ministers do at the policy level deals with policies or strategies. And it's really the commission of police and the head of the JDF that should deal more so with the plans. But most plans and strategies sound very good. What makes the difference is the execution. And I just want to show you, and the, the colors are coincidental. <laughs> but I want to look at 11 years of data over across three administrations. And the first column, the first bar, is the 2008 to 2011 administration. The annual average number of murders in those four years was 1,470. In the 2016 to 2018, those three years, the annual average number of murders, 1,429. And in that different colored period in the middle, 2012 to 2015, uh, when I had responsibility as minister, the average was 1,128, or 300 and odd fewer murders on average every year. Now, I don't think that's coincidental, and I use that because oftentimes a lot of people have strongly held opinions on violent crime, but it's not evidence-based. So I want to start by giving you some evidence. Now, the suggestion by the government is that the state of emergency is a tool they need in their toolbox to, until they can bring crime down to below 400 per, um, per year. Now, unfortunately, that's not how the framers of our constitution intended it to be used. A state of emergency can be declared if action has been taken or is immediately threatened by any person or body of persons of such a nature and on so extensive a scale as to be likely to endanger the public safety. Slide for me. That is not a crime fighting tool. That is an emergency when the very state itself is threatened. It's a temporary measure to address an emergency. At each extension, the conditions must warrant an extension. In other words, if you had a, a, a set of circumstances in January 2017 that justified the declaration, you cannot use those same circumstances a year later to continue to extend the state of emergency. On each occasion, you must assess it based on the co conditions that exist. As members of parliament, we swear an oath to uphold the constitution. And if the constitution says, this is not how you are to use it, then we must abide by that. If we're not happy with it, you can always go to the people in a referendum and change the constitution, Horace. But as long as we have this constitution, let us abide by it. And all the experts, the constitutional experts, Dr. Lloyd Barnett, Mike Hilton, Queen's Council, former Solicitor General, we have written opinions from them that the opposition was on solid ground. But leaving aside, let us go back to perhaps our most famous lawyer and national hero, the right excellent Norman Washington Manley. He said, on speaking to the role of the opposition, it was to preserve democratic procedures and fundamental human rights. 
to protect society from the excesses and corruptions of power that will always be found wherever power finally resides. And that is why the Constitution gives the opposition the frontline responsibility to make this determination whether a suspension of our human rights and democratic procedures are justified. But if we even forget about the legality of it for a moment, and not that we should, but just put that aside for a moment, is it particularly effective? I'm going to show you some slides that suggest it's not. First of all, this is the murders per 100,000 by parish for 2018. And you may not be able to see um, the, the names of the parish at the bottom of each bar, but I'll just help you. The average for Jamaica, and that's the bar on the extreme right, was 47 per 100,000, 47 murders per 100,000 population. In St. James, where we had a state of emergency running for almost the entire year, the average was 54 per 100,000, but coming down from a much higher level in 2017. In St. Catherine, where we had the state of emergency for nine months, the rate was 37 per 100,000. The government was proposing to ex continue extending in those parishes when Westmoreland was at 97 per 100,000, two to three times that rate. Hanover was at 84 per 100,000, and yet the emergency was in St. James and in St. Catherine. So you will see that it was really more a political selection than what existed statistically. But let's look at some other figures. During 2018, with three states of emergency running, we had fewer arrests than we did in 2017. Next slide. We had, more importantly, we had a 20% reduction in arrests with evidence. And now arrests with evidence is where, for example, the police stop somebody and hold them with an illegal gun, or firearm, or drugs, or stolen property. This, these arrests result in a much higher rate of conviction, yet those arrests were down 20%. We recovered fewer firearms, 150 fewer firearms in 2018 and in 2017. And in terms of ammunition, we recovered half what we did in 2017, in 2018. And I want to put up the same chart, or a chart that used the same figures that, that Horace used in one of his. But you'll see, you know, you now you understand why people say they're, they're what? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Um, because we're using the same statistics, and we come to an entirely different conclusion. So in, to the extreme left, where you see the, the line graph coming down steeply, that is really as a consequence of the Tivoli operation in May 2010. It impacted that year for half a year, and then for the next five years, the number of murders kept within a fairly narrow band, 1,100 plus or minus 10%. Um, and that plus or minus 10% really accounts for sort of just um, random differences from year to year. It was in 2013, 2016 rather, and then 2017, that we saw a clear spike. And one of the reasons, we, one of the questions we must ask ourselves is, why did we get that spike in 2017? We need to understand that. And I'm going to suggest that a big part of it was the boneheaded decision to buy used cars for the police. And it was not only a bad decision, because there's not a single other police force in the world that buys used cars, but it was a poorly executed decision because we still don't get the cars today. We're, we're in arbitration trying to get either the cars or the money delivered back. So that's one of the things. I can suggest some others. The undermining of two commissioners of police by the then minister, not Harris in fairness, but by the, the, the previous minister, would have lowered the morale of the police high command. This chart shows you the month by month figures for murders from January 2018 through to January 2019. And what you'll see is that the first six months you had a sort of clear downward trend, and then after that you had a plateau, essentially 100, 
little over 100 on average. So the impact that you had had from the initial introduction of the state of emergency, um, Rear Admiral, was short-lived. You got it in each um, case, maybe for three or four months, but then there was no continuing downward trend. Next slide for me. So when the government presents what is referred to as a fool's choice, it's either a state of emergency or it's going to be rampant criminality and chaos. That is actually not a proper representation of the options. We have other good choices available. We can continue the saturation level policing with the military and police in these communities that was the primary um, contributor to the lowering of the crime rate. Now, Horace spoke to the, his five pillars strategy, the National Crime Prevention and Community Safety Strategy, which he credited to his predecessor, Minister Montague. Uh, minister, but, but I think for, for the record, um, because we're at a university, we must get things correctly. We must get the truth. So in fact, this National Crime Prevention and Community Safety Strategy was developed in 2010, 2011, and approved in 2011. It was a response to the Tivoli operations in 2010. It canvassed wide groups in the public and private sectors, and it was intended to be an all-society effort against violence prevention, or for violence prevention. Um, when I came in in 2013, along with the national security policy, which we did um, through uh, Professor Clayton, and we have followed through on some of the things. MOCA, for example, Horace, was one of the recommendations coming out of that national security policy. But together with that, we did a revision of that national crime prevention and community safety strategy in 2013. And that's where we first announced the four pillars. It was then four pillars, and I'll show you how we got to five pillars. Crime prevention through social development, situational crime prevention, effective policing and justice processes, and reducing reoffending, dealing with the correctional system. So that was my four. And then we had Bobby's five, which was rolled out as a new anti-crime plan. And essentially what he took was the pillar that we call effective policing and justice processes and split it into effective policing and swift and sure justice processes. So essentially, it's the same strategy from 2010, 2011 coming forward. But Harris wasn't to be left out. So in 2018, he announced it for the fourth time. And we see a five-point crime plan unveiled. Um, but essentially, it's the same plan coming through from 2011 to 2013 to 2017 to 20. And it's not, as Harris said, it's not a plan, really. It's a strategy. And a, sort of more philosophical framework. Now, since we're using plan loosely to really describe what it is you've been doing, I wanted to share what we did in 2012 to 2015, which I think contributed to the 300 plus fewer murders per year on average during that time. First of all, we, tra we treated, we took a public health approach to violence. We treated murder and violent crime as an epidemic. And if you start by treating it as an epidemic, and I know this is something that Horace understands, you would understand that there's really only three things that you do to reverse an epidemic. You interrupt transmission, you prevent future spread, and you change group norms to build group immunity. And it's predictable. The, the greatest predictor of a case of violence is a previous case of violence. So when you have a murder here, you can fairly uh, highly predict that there's going to be a reprisal murder, especially in the gang-related activities. So the second step in, is interrupting transmission. And that's, in a sense, the traditional... Sorry, the, the first step is interrupting transmission. I'm using the public health approach. And this involves some of what police normally do. They go in, they saturate an area, put a lot of boots on the ground, 
um, set up vehicle control checkpoints, cordons, curfews. But we emphasize something additional. Could you go back for me? We, we put a lot of emphasis on training violence interrupters. This is something the PMI was doing previously, but we put more resources into the PMI. But we also brought in other partners, the Community Safety and Security Branch, NCU, Northern Caribbean University, to train a whole set of police officers. We had persons who volunteered in a, in a group called Street Pastors. All these were trained to interrupt violence at the community level, to change the mindset, to defuse potential um, ex explosive situations. Next slide. So the second step to interrupt this, to reverse this epidemic, was in crime prevention. And we did a lot of stuff there. That, again, legislation, um, anti-gang, anti-lottery scamming, DNA legislation, anti-money laundering. We tried to improve the mobility, though I'm very jealous. The budget that Horace had just in this last year to buy vehicles was more than my budget for the entire four years. Obviously, we were in the front end of the IMF program, much tighter fiscal constraints. So, you know, you know, whatever we accomplished, we accomplished with pennies rather than dollars and millions of dollars. Um, we tried to increase the training and recruitment. We, we brought in, well, through donations, we acquired thousands of less lethal kits. I wouldn't call them non-lethal, less lethal kits. And if, if the policeman in Spalding had one of those kits, um, perhaps he wouldn't have had to use, resort to the use of his pistol. Um, we, had, we put mobile police posts in communities. We merged the GSF and the ISCF, so we had less officers in administration and more officers in operations. But finally, and the most important from a sustainability point of view, is changing the group norms. And this is you do through social interventions. You know, we have some very dysfunctional elements in our culture. The inform of the dead. The, the scamming is reparation. So we worked with our community-based organizations, churches, NGOs, to build that group immunity, to change the culture, to introduce a culture of lawfulness. Um, slide. So here, here are some of the things we did. Um, the Unite for Change initiative was launched. Um, there's a Stay Alert app, which Bobby Montague relaunched as his own. Um, the Unite for Change initiative. This was very important. I, I begged the new administration when they came in, if it was one initiative, they should continue. It was this, and I would give them you know, all the credit. If they wanted to change the name to, to relabel it from the four to five, I wouldn't mind, but just continue it. But Unite for Change really was facilitating a national coordination of all the violence prevention interventions across government and all sectors of the society. The idea was to move citizens from concern about violent crime to action and to give them opportunities to, to engage and educate. We recognize that doing things like improving parenting was critical in the long term to change the norms and to build that group immunity. So we started putting a lot of sponsorship behind the National Parenting Commission. We, we supported groups that, um, that focused on proper parenting. I remember, for example, Dr. Coombs in, in Mandeville had an organization that was really focused on the impact of fatherlessness. And he said, for example, he shared studies which showed that a child growing up without a father or a boy growing up without a father was 11, more, 11 times more likely to display violent behavior. He was nine times more likely to become a gang member, six times more likely to end up in prison. So we thought one of the things you have to do long term, it's not going to give you a return tomorrow, but long term is focus on parenting. Slide. Um, we, you know, we used flash mobs, we engaged champs, we had, you know, the do the right thing initiative, we had teams going to schools, uh, but essentially we were trying to build the credibility of the police um, on a foundation of trust with the community. 
And one of the things, the important things we did to facilitate that was we amended the Dangerous Drugs Act to decriminalize small quantities of ganja because we had so many young men, tens of thousands, who had been marginalized, who had been consigned to the backwaters of the economy because they got criminal records for smoking a little spliff. And we expunged all their, their, their records as well, all, all previous records. And this removed a lot of friction. This was a source of friction between the police and the communities. Um, we, we have, I have a little case study here. This was in a community, McIntyre Villa, or sometimes referred to as Dunkirk. And we had a terrible, what, what we call a, a, a Valentine's Day massacre there, where a gunman came in on a party, shot up a one-year-old baby, killed dead, and, his, and their father. And in retaliation, that community went seeking out another one-year-old to kill in reprisal. And we thought that, you know, this, this was rock bottom. We went in with social interventions. Um, a year later, we, this was a picture of a mass wedding. And as former Commissioner Coelho was giveaway father for one of the seven brides who was getting married that day. Because we changed the community's image of itself. And we had some great similar projects in West Milan, in August Town, in Vineyard Town, in Clarendon, in Spanish Town. And here's a testimonial from um, one of the community members, a short testimonial. I live in the Dunkirk community, 34 years. And right now, the community is running smooth. There's no violence, no crime. People in the community dialogue with the police and also the pastor, Pastor Allen and Brother Bugs. And I would like Southside, Rockford, Poilers, Tel Aviv, everybody to come together and move like Dunkirk. All right now, I like how Dunkirk can move. God believe me. And so that is Pinky saying it much more effectively than I could. So in closing, and I don't want to use this as an introduction to the Petrojam scandal, but just to quote, just to quote N.W. Manley again. And by the way, crime and corruption are, are you know, handmaidens. Um, but to quote Norman Manley in closing, the role of the opposition is, or part, one of the roles of the opposition is to challenge every abuse of power, every waste of public funds, every attempt to remo remove bureaucratic procedures from public or parliamentary observation, criticism, and control. And I want to reassure you, we will continue to do that job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Chang and former Minister Bunting. Very interesting presentations. Both mentioned the importance of research um, and the evidence to inform our policies and um, the effective continuity of our strategies as we try to reduce crime. So in the interest of time, we will introduce our panelists and then invite them to present five to eight minutes each on the five pillars as have been outlined by both minister and former minister. Uh, first, we will have Professor Anthony Clayton, Alcon Professor from the Institute of Sustainable Development. Then we will have Ms. Paula Llewellyn, QC, Director of Public Prosecutions, followed by Rear Admiral Harley Lewin, former Commissioner of the JCF, <coughs> Commissioner Terence Williams from the Independent Commission of Investigations, Mr. Horace Levy, Deputy Chairman, Board of the Peace Management Initiative and former ex Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice. <coughs> Dr. Herbert Gale, anthropologist from the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work. And Dr. Dacia Leslie, research fellow at Solises and chair of the Crime Prevention and Offender Management Cluster, which organized this esteem panel. So we invite Professor Anthony Clayton for his, pres his short presentation. <laughs> Panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today. I'm going to talk a little bit about <coughs> where we are in terms of the issues with crime and talk about the five pillars strategy. I need to give you a little bit of background first. 
We have roughly 500, 550,000 violent deaths in the world each year. Maybe 20% or less are due to wars. Most of them are the result of criminal and domestic homicides. And yet we don't give it the same level of attention. Terrorism is a relatively small problem in comparison, which gets far more resource, far more attention. In fact, what kills most people is gang-related, crime-related, and domestic homicide. Now, for reasons that we do not entirely understand, the world level of violence has been falling steadily in most parts of the world since about 1985. There are really just two exceptions to that. One of them is Latin America and the Caribbean, and the other is Southern Africa. What we have seen <coughs> is that wherever homicide rates have remained high, it is usually because you have a number of factors coinciding. You have weak institutions, in some cases corrupt government, ready availability of weapons, problems with dysfunctional and broken families, overcrowded prisons, available narcotics, organized crime which operates in many ways beyond the reach of the police, many unemployed young men, a pattern of rapid and chaotic urbanization, and typically dysfunctional justice systems as well. Wherever you see this combination of problems, we have extremely high levels of violence in society. We are currently fifth in the world for violence. Our homicide rate, as Peter Bunting pointed out, peaked in the parish of St. James at 140 per 100,000 at the end of 2016. Just to give you an idea of how off the scale that was, the homicide rate in Afghanistan at the same time was 33 per 100,000. So you were actually a lot safer in Kabul than you were in Montego Bay. Now, most people don't understand this. And I ask people, where would you rather live? Would you rather live in Kabul, Afghanistan, or what, would you rather live in the parish of St. James? And everybody says St. James, because it's what they're used to. And we forget that it was actually one of the world's epicenters of violence and homicide. Of course, it's a few miles away from the beach, it's up in the Montego Hills, and therefore, unless you have reason to go there, you're unlikely to be affected. But we're living with this. Now, the five pillars, <coughs> as um, the two previous speakers have pointed out, are essentially perfectly sensible. We've been working with them since about 2010, since the normalization of Tivoli. All of them are basic elements in most good anti-crime strategies. There's a lot more, however, which is not entirely reflected in the five pillars. Let's drill down a little bit into the problems that underlie our high rates of violence. We have entrenched poverty in some communities. We have very high baked-in levels of structural inequality. We have many people who can only hope to get a very poor education and have very limited employment prospects as a result. We have a pattern of social decay, <clears throat> broken families, neglected and abused children. By the time a child has been exposed to two or three acts of extreme violence, they are more or less lost to you. The chances of making a recovery after that are somewhere between z slender and zero. We have about 20% of our population living in informal settlements. Some of those have become gang-dominated, partly with political collusion in the bad old days. People living in very bad housing, unplanned, unstructured, not built to code. In fact, we have about a quarter of our population living on land that's been stolen, about a third of our population stealing electricity, and two-thirds of the water supplied by the Water Commission is either lost through leakage or lost through illegal connections. What this means is that we have many children being raised in households where theft is normal. Theft is not even theft, it's just what you do to survive. And we have this strange idea that somehow we expect the kids to come out being normal, decent, law-abiding people when they've been growing up with this idea that theft is just a survival strategy. This is compounded by problems of governance, the erosion of the moral legitimacy of people in public life by corruption and political patronage, and links we have never yet managed to entirely sever between politics and organized crime. And then, of course, it becomes self-perpetuating because the high levels of violence are a major deterrent to both domestic retention of domestic capital and inward investment, which perpetuates low rates of economic development and growth. Ready availability of illegal narcotics and weapons mainly from the United States and Haiti, increasingly now 
coming into the Caribbean from Venezuela. And a dysfunctional justice system. Now, I know that there are reforms in hand. I know that the reforms have, are, stum are now already bearing some fruit, but we still have inordinate delays on a number of cases. We have to find ways to streamline and improve the delivery of justice, make it readily available and affordable to all. And a police force which still does not have the appropriate assignation of assets to w ways that will actually have do most to reduce the headline levels of crime. Again, these two last problems are both being addressed, but we still have a far way to go. And as Peter Bunting pointed out, we must never forget that we all talk about only one part of the issue of crime in this country. Everybody talks about the violence, but there is a backdrop to this. There is a second form of crime, which is the economic crime. And this involves people who are very often powerful, well-connected, involved in corruption, misappropriation, misappropriation of funds, money laundering and tax evasion. Now, this has two problems. First of all, it provides top cover for top, for top ranking gang leaders. And second, it gives them a way of laundering funds into the legitimate economy. We have attorneys, we have brokers, we have politicians who have been involved in money laundering. And this is major, enormously problematic. Unless you make it impossible for people to launder the proceeds of crime, they will continue to flourish and continue to operate. And there's a third way in which this is important. Many people in this country do not trust politicians. They regard them all as corrupt. This, in my experience, is absolutely not true. There are many people in public life who are exceptionally brave and work exceptionally hard for this country. Unfortunately, it's not universally true. There are a number of people in public life who are venal and self-interested and corrupt. We have to find a way to get these people out of public office. And the reason why this is important is that everybody in public life plays a role in terms of providing a moral compass to society. And if they fail to do so, then we cannot ex be surprised at the results we get. We cannot be surprised that people think, I'm going to get what's mine, if this is how they see people behaving, people who should be setting an example to everyone else in society. Now, when it comes to planning and strategy, I'm going to take <coughs> a um, slightly heretical view. I've been working on planning and strategy and so forth for about the last 40 odd years. When it comes to violence, however, I think you actually need a slightly different approach. There is a very interesting model, the public health strategy for reducing levels of violence in society. What essentially this reflects is the fact that violence and the causes of violence actually vary quite a lot between different communities. So you go through this very simple four-step process, defining the problem, collecting the data, identifying the particular risk factors in that community, identifying why violence occurs, who are the victims, who are the perpetrators, then developing your intervention strategies, choosing the ones that work, terminating the ones that are not providing results, and scaling up the ones that are providing results. This is a very empirical way to develop good policy. It should never be a matter of the, the minister personal pride. I can't say this is not working because this was my policy. If it's not working, we should be willing to say, shut it down. If it is working, it doesn't matter who came up with the idea. It's a good idea. We should support it. I, in theory, we should be at the point of developing and testing intervention strategies. In my darker moments, I feel perhaps we're not there yet. We seem to be invest so much time and effort in coming up with policies and strategies. But I'll tell you, ten, it's a huge amount of work developing a strategy and a policy. I know because it's what I do with a lot of my time. But that's only 10% of the work. 90% is implementation. And that's the bit that we, quite often, where we're weak. And we fail to implement properly. And so we have to go round this loop over and over again, instead of just following through with what's working. Let me just share a couple of examples with you of policies that were actually based on research and evidence, and they were implemented, and they worked. Carly, Colombia. 1994, the homicide rate for the city was 124 per 100,000. Research was done. It was found that most murders were linked to people drinking too much and having, a having access to weapons. 
The city introduced restrictions on alcohol and restrictions on guns, two very simple measures. Citywide homicide rate came down by 35% in a matter of months. Another example, city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. 2005, the homicide rate for the city was 42 per 100,000. In the favelas, the ghetto communities where about 20% of the population lived, the homicide rate was over 80 per 100,000. 2008, they started the pacifying police program. This is a, actually the basis for what we did with the Zosos. It's a clear hold and build strategy. The police, the paramilitary police, the army would go in, overwhelming numbers, not to get involved in a firefight with bad guys, but simply to get situational dominance. Within three months, they would hand over to the community police who would then be there for the long term. And they would go in and then say, we're not going in 90 days. If it takes 25 years, we'll be here 25 years. If it takes longer, we'll be here longer. They provided stability, reassurance, and continuity. They got to know everybody in the community, and they worked with them to build a decent, law-abiding community. Four years time, four years, the city rate of homicide was down by 50%. And in some of the favelas, the homicide rate was down to zero. These are strategies where you get very short-term and dramatic results. And in our case, in less than a year, we brought our national homicide rate down by 20% with the ZOSOs and the SOEs, mainly as a result of the ZOSOs and the SOEs. Now, let me say that I am, have very deep concerns about how we did the ZOSOs and the SOEs. I've said so publicly. We did the clear and hold, but we never did the build properly. And it's actually the build part that's really critical. The only point in doing clear and hold is so that you can do build. That's where you fix the roads, you fix the street lights, you fix the schools, you address the broken families, you, put, you fix things so that people have a chance of a decent life. And that's the bit where we always seem to fall down. And so my concern there was that we didn't get anything like the mileage out of it that we should have done. We didn't ensure that the program was sustainable. But nonetheless, we brought our national homicide rate down by 20% in a year, even doing it badly. And these are all examples of just how quickly we could really solve this problem if we just did two things. First of all, put our minds to it. Two, elevated the whole issue of national and citizen security above party politics, because you can't get anywhere if you don't have continuity. We should be happy to say, if it's working, I'm just going to continue it. I don't have to reinvent this, and if it's not working, I'm going to terminate it. With that kind of consistency of approach, I think we could turn our crime situation around in under four or five years. Other countries have done it. They have started off from worse positions than we're in, and they have actually achieved dramatic results in a remarkably short spaces of time. With a similar approach, I think we could have equally dramatic results in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, I didn't know I was going to be making a presentation, but I'm here. I speak from the heart. I want to know and I want by a show of hands to know how many persons here would be prepared to give a statement to the police if they witnessed a crime and give evidence in court. I want a show of hands. And I'm also including you. A show of hands. Who would be prepared to do that? I would say it's only about a half. Because I, th I think some of you are giving a show of hands because it would look bad. Now, I've heard all about the, well, I listened to Dr. Chang and I listened to Mr. Bunting. And I must confess, as I heard the two gentlemen, I think they are both very well-meaning. They are sincere. But there was a part of me that, like Martin Luther, I have a dream that one day, crime will be taken out of political one-upmanship and consideration. And we will see a situation where it's a relay. And when the goodly gentlemen speak, 
you don't get a sense of who is trying to say, oh, I was better than you, or I am better than you. Because guess what? As we have seen recently, crime is no respecter of persons, even when you are an MP. Now, I come in at the back end as a prosecutor, a very humble prosecutor. Your taxes pay my salary. And I have heard the debate about crime plan, revisiting crime plan, what is a crime plan. Well, I'm here to say that when we read our files dealing with anti-gang matters, and we will be embarking on about 10 prosecutions of some big gang matters that we have worked with CTOC behind the scenes. When I look and I see the video recording of an ex-gangster who is prepared to give evidence against his former gangsters, and when they are outlining in detail their organization, everybody, including a corrupt police officer who has been charged with them, has a role to play. And then when I think of the fact that when you check out a lot of people in communities, and I'm here to tell you, most people, whether because of apathy or the culture, are really not interested in helping the police. Because in some communities, and I'm going to say it, because the politicians can't say it, because it's not politically correct, and they may lose votes, but you have communities where part of the culture is to make sure that crime never sees the light of day in terms of prosecution. You have communities where it is a part, it's, it's their forty that the bloody clothes and the gun and all of that will be hidden. I remember I heard of a case where, you know, those potter soup and you see those ladies having those delicious crab in the pots boiling and we all enjoy the corn and whatever. And I have heard a police officer tell them, Miss Llewellyn, you believe that when we were searching, a gunman ran in there and he ran out and it turned out that he dropped the gun in one of the potter soup. And that old lady looked at us and looked at us plain. Said she don't say anything. She hasn't heard anything. She doesn't know what they're talking about. And the gun is in the pot of soup. So <laughs> this is why I am guided by evidence. Sometimes I don't even bother. Well, I'm not on social media. I'm not on social media. But what I find in terms of, for me, what will be most effective in fighting crime is if Perhaps all our children from basic school could be taught about civics. What it means to be a Jamaican and a citizen. The responsibility of being a citizen. You cannot imagine what it is like as a prosecutor to see a mother whose son was killed tell you, Miss Llewellyn, it doesn't matter what you say. You cannot convince me to go and give evidence, even though it was my son. What is done has already been done, and I'm moving on. But we need to help a lot of persons in what you could call dysfunctional um, communities where, okay, you hear about clear, hold, and build. But to my mind, based on what I've seen, you would have to be building for months and for years because so many of us i'm sure have tried to help young men or young women from some of these communities and they're not doing badly but they will tell you that when they have to go back and live in some of these communities if they don't yield to the culture in terms of hiding or giving excuses for criminality because you are going to be shamed as an informer, or you're going to be threatened. You know, we, we, we really have to see where we can put in place things like civics as simple as you take it. Because a lot of people don't understand what it means to be a citizen. If you witness a crime, then you must be prepared to say what you know. I find too often in Jamaica, a lot of people coming from some of the misinformation in social media, are ready to speculate and to indicate and say what is happening in the courts. We are being told the courts are dysfunctional. 
when what happens in reality is that if you don't get the cooperation of the citizens who have witnessed crime, who know about it, then you will not get a successful prosecution. Happily, if you look in the Court of Appeal, where appellants or applicants are appealing their convictions, you will find that there are a lot of convictions. And I'm here to tell you that in the circuit courts, where we do murder, sexual offenses, and cases in that jurisdiction, we have more convictions than acquittals. But guess what? That fact is not sexy enough for a lot of the media to talk about. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would encourage you, and I hope next year if I come here, I find that it's 95% of the hands that will go up and say that I am ready to participate in my community and give evidence or give a statement if I see or I witness crime being committed. Thank you. seated too long. Could I ask how many of you here um, believe or know of a crime plan for Jamaica? Show of hands, since we're in the mood for showing hands. Okay. All right, let's get started. I'm going to stick to the topic, revisiting Jamaica's crime plan. If I'm to believe by the show of hands, I'm revisiting something that doesn't exist. So I don't know how I'm revisiting, but let's see how we get along. But before we start, I think there are one or two things we have to understand clearly, because if we don't, we're going to run aground. Because there are two terms that we use interchangeably, not knowing what we're talking about. One is strategy, and the other is tactics. And we just throw it around, even security professionals, like confetti. And we use it loosely. And the first thing we need to do is to understand what it is and what the difference is. Now, a strategy is going to define your long-term goals and how you're planning to achieve them. In other words, your strategy gives you the path you need to achieve whatever mission that your organization has. It's a game plan. It is a game plan. It is the big picture, the overarching big picture. By itself, it means nothing. It's just a set of... It's a wish list. They have to now be supported by a number of tactics, operational measures, or in our case, we'd say initiatives. And they have to be aligned. So if one of your strategy is to do so and so, there has to be a number of supporting initiatives to support those strategies. So whilst your strategy is there for the longer term, your initiatives may change as the circumstances change. And so your initiatives are flexible. So strategy is more concrete and long term. Strategy and tactics work together as a means to an end. And they have to be in line with each other. So the crime plan. First of all, I don't like the title. Because every time I think of crime plan, it's the first impression I get, this is something the criminals are planning to come and teeth us. It is their plan. So I always use the term policing plans. And I think we better change that right now. It's a policing plan. How is it that the police plan to police the people to whom they have a duty to serve? It's a policing plan. So, Let's get started. We can go back to 2007. In 2007, we have a document referred to as the National Security Policy for Jamaica. 
towards a secure and prosperous nation. This was a very comprehensive document, a planning and a strategy developed by a team of local and international experts. That team was headed by Rear Admiral Peter Brady. And that came out in 2007. But it was not a policing plan. Not a policing plan. So where did we go from there? And by the way, it was never intended to be a policing plan. That was the overarching national security, defense and security policy because it cuts across all agencies, customs, immigration, etc., etc. Not just the security forces. It was that strategy that recommended that there ought to be a strategic review of the Jamaica Defense Force and a strategic review of the Constabulary Force. The Defense Force was done, and it has been done twice since then, because when you have a review, it cannot be something you review and leave it forever. It has to be done at intervals, three to five years. The review of the Constabulary Force was done, and there has been some measure of implementation, not one I am happy or proud of, but it is what it is. We moved then to 2012. Mr. Bunting is quite familiar with this one. The National Security Policy for Jamaica 2012, a new approach. Now, Professor Clayton is very familiar with this. He wrote it. It's a beautiful resource document with some useful recommendations, but it's not a policing plan, and neither was it intended to be. As a matter of fact, um, I got the impression that your work was unfinished. Uh, there was follow-up work. There was, well, it's unfinished, or unpublished. <laughs> so, now we come to the five pillar strategy. I'm giving you all the background, you know, and the sequencing of plans. We're not short of plans, you know. We are not short. So if anybody come and tell us we are going to do further study. Study what? The work is done. You may need to dust it off. You may need to take um, note of um, uh, innovations in technology and what the thieves are now doing and what they are using. Just dust it off. It's still good. Now, I will not quibble with the five pillar strategy because I'm not here to quibble about anything. It's a heavily referenced kind of an academic document, 214 pages. Now, if you're here or like me who have a short attention span, you're not going to read the whole thing. If I wasn't coming here, I wouldn't have read the whole thing. And it need not have been such a weighty document. As a matter of fact, if my memory served me right, it could have been very much help with an executive summary for people like me. Now, overall, it's a good document, but it is not a policing plan. Now, so where does, where's this holy grail called the policing plan that seems to have been eluding us all these years? Does it exist? According to most of you, it doesn't exist. I'm happy to report that it does exist. The policing plan is not named the policing plan. But if you go to the JCF website, deep into the bowels of the website, you see a referenced document called Jamaica Constabulary Force Corporate Plan 2012 to 2015. Read it. Read it. It sets out, is that a minute? I'm wrapping up, I'm always on time, in time. It speaks to the strategies, it speaks to the initiatives, but therein also was a little confusion because it says strategies slash um, initiatives. When it really is not strategies, it is initiatives, and it should have been left there. 
So it is there. It is called a corporate plan. Now, I don't like the title either. It's a personal quirk. Hey, JCF is not a Fortune 500 company. Don't come out with a corporate plan. It's the policing plan. And we should stick to it. Or if you prefer, the crime plan. So I'm here to tell you that it does exist. The operational initiatives are there. The key performance indicators are there. And how do you measure success? It's there, as you'd expect in any document of that nature. Now, for the immediate future, and I think Minister Chang mentioned it in passing, I hear that there's going to be a new overarching plan called Plan Secure Jamaica, which I assure you, I hope, will draw on work that has been done earlier. I'm quite sure it is drawing on it. From which we would expect that the Ministry of National Security, Security would pull what affects the National Security Ministry to come up with its uh, strategies. And you would expect that the police would have reflected in their policing plan those strategies handed down from the Ministry with all of the supporting initiatives and that they will be working it. Now, it has to be a public document. Don't hide it from the people. Because you have to take it to the people and discuss it with them, because the plan you draw from 103 or uh, Oxford Road, whilst it's generic, the problems in Montego Bay are slightly different from the problems in Portland. So there has to be minor variations. So there's nothing wrong even if at the divisional level they come up with their own policing plans, which is to take the national one from the police headquarters, sit down, discuss it, and appropriately modify it in their town hall meetings, in discussion with the people. That is how you make them a part of it. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests at the head table, um, ladies and gentlemen, you have my slide? Thank you so much. Um, I intended to make two points this afternoon, but in light of time, I'll make only one. The, one of the five pillars of the crime plan is effective policing. And I'll ask you the question, if you, can you go to the fifth slide, please? Can you have effective policing with a police force which is not disciplined or accountable? I ask you that question. Because when we look at the rates of high murders throughout the world, there is one constant factor in those countries in Latin America and South Africa that have high rates of murders. One constant factor is the state and state agents themselves having low respect for life and low respect for law and order. So if the state and its agents don't respect life, don't respect law, then the citizenry is not going to respect life and respect law. So could you go to the next one, please? We have a very frank document, the 2008 Strategic Review of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. And it speaks to the JCF having very bad cultures. Now, I know sometimes when we criticize the police, people say, oh, it's not all police. Of course it is not all police. Of course it is not. But there are significant numbers in the force who perpetuate these bad cultures, which cause the force to be pulling one way and to have members within the same force pulling against them. So the force, it speaks of members of the force being informants for gangs, members of the force being involved in contract killings, members of the force planting evidence. Now, one would have thought that after that strategic review, there would have been a great effort to make the force more disciplined 
and more accountable. But what do we see? Very little done except for the formation of Indicom between 2008 and now regarding making the force more disciplined and more accountable. I do agree that we need to improve facilities and conditions for work. But the cultures in the JCF which caused its members to be, could you go down two slides please? Which caused its members, one more, which caused its members to have these deleterious cultures had to have been permissive leadership over a long period of time. And what did we see? Last year we reported that since the formation of Indicom, we reported a number of gazetted officers for breach of JCF discipline. And no disciplinary proceedings were held. Not one. So you have a discipline problem, a leadership problem, and you are doing nothing to bring people to account. So all the planning of a crime plan or a crime strategy is not going to work unless you have one disciplined and accountable force which is there working together to meet those plans. Instead of a force where one officer cannot be told things because he may tell the gang, or a force where one officer is planting evidence, or one officer is abusing citizens and bringing down the force. So what we have is a failure of the accountability structures in the force. And what I think as a recommendation that we need to do is to bring greater civilian oversight in the constabulary force. We have a police service commission that I don't think is able to do enough to make the force accountable. And I think we should have a police authority, go back please, go right back to the right. We should have a police authority on a national level which sets targets for the commissioner of police, appraises the commissioner of police on meeting these targets, recommends gazetted officers to be removed for failing to meet targets. And at the area level, in the parishes, we should have local authorities with civilians on those local authorities which replicate the same thing at the parish or area level so that we can truly have the community being involved in policing, crime control and feel part of the entire crime plan. Next slide, please. You, we have the minister is empowered under our Constabulary Force Act to make rules for the running of the force. The last such rules were promulgated by Minister Errol Anderson of blessed memory in the 1980s. They're very outdated rules that we now have. And when you read the rules, you get the impression that the rules are not facing up to what are the current problems in the force. The rules speak about uniforms and how officers should dress. More than it speaks about ethics and anti-corruption. There are two sentences in the rules about use of force. Only two sentences. So where is the ministerial direction to the force to say, here are the standards that we require for policing? Well, I'm all up, and that is my point. The only way we can have an effective crime plan is with an effective police force, which doesn't just mean working in good conditions. It means a disciplined force, which must come from a force which is accountable to the public of Jamaica. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, folks. I was asked to comment on this document 
But coming after the main speakers there, Horace Chang. Sorry he has the same first name, but anyway, they'll, they'll be here. And Peter Bunting and all the other five other speakers, the scene changes a bit. Anyway, what's clear is that it's not a plan. And it was partly created by the PNP. That's what we've learned from the main speakers. Right? Congratulations. <laughs> it's, it's really a telephone directory a long list of things, and there are good things in there you can agree with, and other things you don't agree with. Um, part of the problem with it is the priorities. It starts off by setting seven, then it moves immediately to five, which are the five pillars. Then later on on page 28, it gets down to two. Establishing the capacity of security forces, that's number one. And number two is building resilience in the community. Well, it's number one that really gets all the ammunition, right metaphor, I think. Um, the community resilience kind of fades into the background. The fact is that judging by their actions and a few words here and there, the actual plan being pursued by the state right now has the three following components. Though Dr. Chang has promised to give us more detail later on, but I don't want to preempt him, but my suggestion is, one, it's suppression. That's the first element in the plan, suppression. Suppress, suppress, suppress. In other words, just stop the murders dead in their tracks by putting more and more boots on the ground. Not right? He says there's nothing wrong with that. Right? Number two is community by community. That's a quotation from the Prime Minister. He's going to tackle it community by community, parish by parish, if I may expand a bit. And that's how it's going to be done. Now that takes a while, doesn't it? It's going to take some time. Um, but he's promising, the Prime Minister, 20 Zozos, 20. And perhaps all of them at once, we don't know. We'll wait and see. And the third element, which follows from the, that one, is that we're going to extend it right up to elections. And maybe three elections. Because there's a precedent, a precedent, not a president, a precedent back in 1976 when we had uh, an SOE, a state of emergency, which went right through the 1976 elections. Remember that one? So, there you are. That's their, their plan. You don't think so? Yeah, man, it's the plan. It's the one in actual practice. And crucially, the background to it is, as Dr. Chang says, we've never invested in the police. Okay, true enough. But we have never invested in communities either. We never invested in the justice system either. We're not investing in garbage collection either. How many other things you can list that we haven't invested in? Education, quite a few others. What it all goes back to, because I tend to go back to roots all the time, is that we have a very weak state. A very weak state. To try to understand what's going on in Jamaica, think of it, that we have a very weak state. That's why we have the weaknesses that Commissioner Terence just pointed out in the police force, because it stems from higher up. And why do we have a weak state? And we won't fix anything until we fix the weakness of the state. Why do we have a weak state? Well, there's several reasons it can be advanced. One of them which I heard last night at a different forum, and I agree there's some truth to it, is historical. 
that the state under colonial rule was also weak in that there are sections of the state that really didn't fall under their, its purview. It was weak. And things went on. Of course, it would suppress some of these things, but others went on uh, and so on. So it was weak. And we inherited this. But I think there's a second reason, among others, which is perhaps stronger. And that is, I would respectfully suggest, the competition between the two political parties that form our state. They spend most of their time fighting each other, thinking about how they can retain power or get it. That is their main preoccupation. It's not the well-being of the poor people, the masses of the people, the people below their class, and in many instances their color. It's their own survival as a party, and they're winning the next election. That's my suggestion. And if we want to change the police force, because notice, Dr. Chang talks about the need, various needs, police stations, police vehicles, police uniforms. And they've been talking about a new service act. Where is that service act? They've been in power now for three years. The PNP were there before them. And there has been a lot of talk over many years about reforming the police force. We're no closer to it. What we have instead is strengthening the JDF, not the JCF. The JDF now has more boots. It has a battalion and housing down in St. James. So we're not building up the police force, we're building up the military. And the polls are suggesting that a lot of our people, increasing numbers, would be quite happy if we had a coup tomorrow. Fortunately, so far at least, the military is not that way inclined, fortunately. But as long as we have that mentality, we will have support for more and more SOEs, states of emergency, and more and more ZOZOs. And those will not cure the situation. What we need is to take a look at the good <coughs> cases, the good examples that exist. The Peace Management Initiative, yes, I'm on the board, unpaid by the way, has created, along with good community policing, some excellent examples in central Kingston, in Clarendon, and one or two other places. Why not look at the practices that work and copy those, do more of those? Peter Bunting said they'd given support to the peace management initiative they had, but not enough. The present government has given support to the Peace Management Initiative, but not enough. They work in relatively small pockets. Expand it. Do more of it. We would need fewer police cars and fewer police. Thank you very much. Distinguished colleagues on the platform, colleagues here at the UWI, brothers and sisters, I want to point you to I want to point you to six six issues very quickly uh, and just six matter for us to contemplate on the reduction of violence. I want to remind persons while we're getting this ready that I uh, my primary concern and training is in the reduction of violence. Uh, every country has crime. Jamaica's violence is simply too much. And that is where the problem is. Uh, to the extent where, in ignorance, we have made a marriage of crime and violence. In fact, I had a friend who said to me, boy, Herb's more on the crime of violence too much. You know. All right, so number one, uh, Jamaica is a violent country. Uh, with a very violent past, and our situation is one with comparative figures to a war zone. Okay? 
It means that uh, since the year 2000 when I went to study violence, this is something we've been emphasizing. A lot of the theories and stuff that we run around with don't really apply because our figures actually show extreme violence and not very moderate violence. If you have, uh, if you have figures suggesting uh, a war zone, it means we expect three levels of frames. The first would be ceasefire. The second would be redeployment of combatants. And we're talking about mainly males between the age of 15 and 34 years. And then long-term plans to have reduction. And reduction, by the way, has a, has a quantitative definition. It means that your figures should be dipping by, listen very carefully, 1% to 3% per year. Usually the easiest way to go to a country and see that they are reducing violence is that it is almost not noticeable. Okay? Anything at all that drops suddenly will rise suddenly. There is Jamaica. Since the year 2000, it's ranked fourth most violent zone in the world with an average of 48.125 murders per 100,000. Okay, so we're fourth. And if you notice, the country that was once the mother of all violence, Colombia, has dropped to fifth. Okay? So if you look very carefully, if you understand violence, you know for sure that you have to strip violence down into its combatant frames. And the, the, the group we are primarily concerned about would be, of course, male combatants age 15 to 34. Kindly note for me, we're looking here at the average for 2010 to 16. The average for Kingston for young men would be 414. And please note the average homicide rate or war-related deaths for Iraq, U.S. occupation zone frame was 202 per 100,000. Kingston for the combatant age is 414 and for St. James, 282. All right. So we're kind of beginning to understand what we're dealing with. So let's move to number two. So number one is simply that our figures are nothing that we should smile about. Our figures really represent a situation that is a crisis. And I'm not immediately suggesting suppression, suppression, suppression. I think that's a new way of describing it, right? Right, Horace? Right? Good. But I'm just simply saying to you that those figures must stick in your minds if you are going to begin to think about re reduction of violence. Number two, the country has never had a successful violence reduction action. Okay? I can tell you about Belize. I can tell you about I can tell about El Salvador, Guatemala, and all the countries I've worked with the governments. I can tell you, in this region, I have never seen a successful action. I've seen plans, loads and loads of plans. I, I spent seven days in a camp with the government of Belize, hatching out a plan, and then I called year after year to ask about action, but Caribbean people love the word plan, not action. Let's move on. So since independence, right? We have had various decent looking plans, but the focus has been on what? On suppression, all right? Even when PMI and other groups have overachieved, governments have focused their investments on suppression. The trend has been A, spiking murders, B, suppression response, C, forced fall in murders, please note the words, and that's how we use it in violence studies, a forced fall. A forced fall among boy and people means don't bat your eyes, stay awake. As the movie says, stay woke. D, no redeployment of combatants or primary focus. And E, therefore, the spike returns. And this time, on average, it is 4.99% higher than the year before. All right, so let's look at this. We're looking at the 1960s, right, which marks independence, am I right? When the homicide rate for Jamaica was four per 100,000, which is, come on, talk to me. We're talking here about 15 times 
lower than last year and 12 times lower than, than, sorry, than the year before and than last year, all right? And if you notice, the blue line is what we call clear up, okay? I don't have enough time to teach you what these things mean, so Google it afterwards. The red line is about, sorry, the, the red line is clear up, the blue line is, of course, murders. So there's a relationship between clear up and murders. As your murders, as your murders increase, your clear up will fall. Why? Because you, your material input has not kept pace. Let me take my time. So what you're seeing there is a mirror image. And wherever you have an, a mirror, it means that the other factors are not strong enough to change the mirror. We're clear? So in other words, if Jamaica was actually inputting in the primaries I'm going to spend two minutes to talk to you about, it means that you could not have a mirror so perfect. In fact, when you run it into a graph system, its deviation is less than 1%. Perfect. So high murders, low conviction, low clear-up, just like that. And it, it tells us something that we've been doing the same thing since independence, getting the same results, and it's beginning to bother me now because I'm certain if you had a child who goes to school every day, comes home with the same failing grade, you would begin to, 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 to start kicking and carrying on and screaming and ripping out your hair. But we are comfortable. It's crazy. So let's, let's take the last, let's take the last uh, uh, 2000 to 2015 and I want you to look at something. I want you to see Jamaica is in the green, right? I want you to reflect on something. You see a spike, then you see a dip, right? Can you see that? And everybody here is that right at the spike, you get a new special force, right? Or a new suppression plan which causes the dip, right? And watch again, what happens? It gets buoyant, it bounces back, right? And it keeps doing that dance, right? Like a shuffle, right? all the way until we get to 2015, where the last trench we've seen faded. Is he there with me? Good. Number three. So Jamaica has two gang violence hubs. And these are really bothering all of us internationally when we meet to discuss Jamaica. This part really bothers us. So there are two hubs in Jamaica, right? And one of the factors driving the spread is suppression. Stay with me on this. In other words, your strategy can actually create a spread. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. Gangs naturally spread as they are economically based, right? So gangs will spread automatically without anybody interfering in them because they're based on not just pride and identity, but also dollars. However, suppression helps to relocate gangs, okay? If you hit a pothole here while you're driving and there's a new road, what do you do? Take the new road, right? Okay? So gangs have something we call the 19 frames of adaptability. Okay? So let's go. So when there are plans, so when you have no redeployment, then gangs actually simply move to a new location and you get something looking like this. All right, that's basically showing what the, the, what the homicide rate looks like. Next one. All right, so here are the two hubs, right? You can see the one in blue, that's Kingston, right? And if you look at those figures very carefully, what you'll see is Kingston, which has had, since the year 2000, the highest murder rate in the region. And then it spreads to St. Catherine. And then St. Catherine uh, has a new child called Clarindon. And then Clarindon is trying to, uh, to have a relationship with Manchester. You can see that, right? You can see little X going on there. And then we go from Montego Bay, right? Montego Bay has, of course, hit Westmoreland very hard, right? And then, of course, Westmoreland has moved into Hanover. And then, and, and then, and at the same time, St. James has also moved into Trelawney. And then, of course, they are trying to see if they can work with St. Elizabeth, which is there in Brown. 
Now, if we continue working with tertiaries, and this is where I help you now to understand. If you continue working with tertiaries, you are going to have one certain impact, and that is the spread of homicides. But let's look at number four quickly. Violence models are complicated, right? And they require sophisticated plans to, ar to address the problem. They rest on core assumptions that violence is always a byproduct of our social ills. And I illustrate this to you by examining with you the situation in Belize where I work very closely with the people. Before a group, before three gangs had a meeting to begin to use the Belizean corridor for the transport of cocaine, their homicide rate never exceeded 12 per 100,000. As soon as the, the, the cocaine trade moved away from the Mona Passage, which is the Caribbean Sea area, to the central corridor, which is Panama, all the way across to Belize, United States, the homicide rate blew up to 48. Now, I always remind the people, it's not just the size of the hurricane that hits you, it's what the hurricane hits, am I right? Which is why we had less deaths from uh, Ivan than Gilbert. Because Gilbert had more poor houses to play with. So it means that you must really begin to sit down to examine violence as an issue. That's what our violence situation looks like. A history of violence. On the right side, we've had a post-slavery trauma situation of fathers and mothers and parenting problems, the torture of boys leading to gangs, and fear factor in the JCF. On the other side, we have poor segmented factional frames leading to weak, Horace spoke about that, Horace Levy that is, uh, weak central political authority causing police officers to operate as if they are on their own. And then we have Indicom, which is working with, with saying to them, you can't do this, but a lot of persons not being provided real options in a real lifetime to understand what really happens. It's like teachers who are accustomed to beating the color of kids. And then they say to me, Herbs, Dr. Herbs, I hear you talking about, about not beating the kids, but nobody has taught me the alternatives. And you have to, we have to begin to look at these things, right? So number five, half of our murders are committed by repeat killers. Let me give you the figures. For Jamaica, 53% of our murders are committed by repeat killers. Belize, 51%. Trinidad and Tobago, 48%. St. Kitts and Nevis, 45%. The entire region has the bulk, if not, if not the bulk, of our murders being committed by repeat killers. And every single repeat killer I have worked with has the exact same story of a horrible parenting frame. Can we get that? So in other words, if you look at this very quickly with me, it says that 45% of the inner city, of 3,000 inner city young men who were in this project, out of 3,000, 45% of those who were never killed were tortured, which is basically the average in an inner city community. And we're talking about ants' nests. We're talking about rubbing chicken back fat on children and making sure the, the ants can find them. We're talking about beating children until they block out. We're talking about sl slow poisoning children so they cannot become attractive to dance. And we can't talk about families doing these things unless we begin to give them options that they can do other things. That's the point I'm making. If we look at those who've killed once, they've been tortured. If we look at those who've killed twice, the percentage is moving. And every single shutter in this entire group, which is 0.5% of the entire 3,216 young men in this study, every single shutter who kills more than, meaning they've killed more than three persons, have been tortured severely. So let's close. Any violence plan must address violence at three levels with emphasis on the primaries. And I make no apology about it. Any Caribbean country, I work with seven countries now, any country I walk into and they don't have a solid primary plan, their violence is always going to be in their face. So let's see if we spend 90 seconds and recognize this. Let's go. What's primary? 
If your primaries do not break down, you cannot have a violence problem in your country. And by, by that, we're talking about the preventative things, making people recognize that they're human beings, meaning they must be in school. There's absolutely no way. Right now, the struggle I have in Belize is to get the country to recognize a human being as a school goer until the age 18. And I'm going to keep on this fight in the region until people get tired of me. There's no way you can deny communities 50, the highest I've found in Jamaica, 52% of young men between age 6 and 18 were out of school. Do I need any better recruitment than that if I'm going to raise hell? So we need to have these things. Let's move to, to, the, to the secondary, because you can read. The secondary meaning the curative. So the, so the primary is the preventative. The idea of everybody having a basic human right. Such as when you look at European countries, there is a very narrow gap in terms of child survivability index. Jamaica's own looks like this. Pow! The life of a child in a prep school and the life of a child in a primary school were gradually closing, but it still looks very frightening. Curative means that we have to begin to focus on redeployment. And it means not just investing in a young man or a young woman, but his or her entire family, ensuring that they have temporary work until you can begin to build in them an idea of training and career development so that they can become not just employed, but employable. And let's take tertiary before we go. That is where we begin. So we begin again, the process is what? Ceasefire. Morphine. If you are having a surgery, you need morphine to feel better so you can think. But after the morphine, you can't become addicted to it. You have to move on to what? The surgery. And finally, you have to begin to change your lifestyle in after a surgery so that your body itself can recover. Violence is the same thing. After the ceasefire, must come redeployment of combatants. In a single project alone with John Woods in Belize, we redeployed half of the members of Crips and Blood in five communities, and the murder rate of Belize dropped by 45.2%. Redeployment is what is absent in the region. And all we get, the best I've seen is from Belize, a single project. After the project is over, the kids call me and say, Dr. Herbs, you, you don't know. Nobody then was telling me, say, done which means there's no continuity which makes the project become a program. Take care of yourselves and let us all work together to begin this process of reducing violence, not suppressing it. I'm not into any pressure cooker. Because after the, the tertiaries must come the what? The secondaries and the primaries. Violence reduction is a long-term, very patient process and we all must become educated to this fact. Jobless. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students, good afternoon. The excellent presentations which went ahead suggest that we have the answers we need. And uh, maybe what is needed is us working closer together in a harmonized way. But before I go into my five-minute presentation, allow me to convey apologies on behalf, to, on behalf of Mr. Peter Bunting, who had to leave early because of our prior engagement. And secondly, to redirect your attention away from the polemics underlying definitions of what, a, what constitutes a plan. Notwithstanding that the five-pillar pil strategy if further developed with measurable, specific, time-bound indicators and targets can be considered a plan of action. The, I want you to put your attention towards what often is considered the back end of the criminal justice system, which is corrections, and for us to focus on a vulnerable population, children in conflict with the law, these are persons below 18 years of age, suspected or accused of committing an offense. 
in 2017, 334 children were arrested for Category 1 crimes, mainly robbery. 2,457 appeared before the court for various offenses ranging from murder to malicious destruction of property, but mostly wounding, assault, assault occasioning bodily harm. That same year, 80 children were admitted to juvenile institutions, mainly for shoplifting, larceny, and three for uncontrollable behavior, which of course should be off the books. In 2015, 89% of attempted suicides that took place in the correctional facilities were amongst children on remand. In many cases, a child who comes into conflict with the law represents a fundamental failure to fulfill that child's right to adequate care and protection at an early stage of that child's life. Many are denied the right to education, shelter, security, and are working as child laborers. Once having entered the justice system, some are held in detention for long periods awaiting trial. This makes them vulnerable to further violence victimization. The research suggests that in order to break the cycle of crime and the revolving door, children in conflict with the law need to be extended greater protection. A number of child-friendly juvenile justice measures have been implemented aimed at pr promoting and protecting the best interests of the child. Such moves are in keeping with a number of international instruments, including the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child of 1989, ratified by Jamaica in 91. Additionally, we have seen promotion of diversion as an alternative non-custodial program. We have also seen discontinuation of the mixing of child and adult inmates and a number of international donors, including USAID and UNDP, have come on board to partner with the government in seeking to improve access to reintegration services. So what's the problem? Um, more steps need to be taken to safeguard the rights of children in conflict with the law, with the hope that they will leave the facilities and lead productive and law-abiding lives. The gains of the interventions implemented will not be sustained, however, if it is that we do not know what works, again, highlighting the importance of rigorous research. I mean, it's unacceptable that in 2017, almost 60% of, of the suicides committed, there was no determinable cause. Every child must learn and every child can learn, but yet pers the children inside the facilities are not um, privy to the quality of education enjoyed by children in the wider community. Better ways must be found to improve the quality of education offered to um, children in cost custody so that when they leave the facilities, they are able to better reintegrate into mainstream education. It cannot be overstated that the unnecessary criminalization and exclusion of children in extremely difficult circumstances should be prevented at all costs. Thus, to ensure that the safeguards articulated in the five pillar strategy are realized, it is important that decision makers recognize that advancing the rights of children in conflict with the law requires understanding who they are and their likely futures. This, again, highlights the importance of research and a strengthened partnership with policymakers and researchers, as well as the need for greater evidence-based decision-making, and Professor Clayton alluded to that. Again, um, and this is the point on which I would disagree with Rear Admiral, I think there needs to be a whole of criminal justice approach where all relevant institutions must be strengthened to deliver more joined up, efficient, and effective services. The experiences of countries such as Sweden suggest that we have the legislation in place and 
the policies that are there, if only we effectively enforce them, that would be one of the solutions towards deterring children in conflict with the law from the criminal justice system. Also, there is, there, there is a plan in place for a more integrated response. I mean, there's a need to ensure that there is an integrated partnership with the CPFSA, the Child Protection Agency, and the Department of Correctional Services, especially as it relates to the case management system, which is largely paper-based. So there are a number of things that can be done, basic things. I mean, just doing a needs assessment of everybody who come in contact with um, the correctional facilities. Um, is, is quite basic and it may not necessarily mean more resources but the better use of resources. Finally, if Jamaica is to realize, because everything that we're talking about today, a strategy policy plan, it's in line with the Vision 2030, which is the National Development Plan. And just to say that goal three speaks to creating a more secure, cohesive, and just society, which is in line with SDG 16. Um, and so there is an overarching plan, and there is a need for greater alignment with these plans, as well as implementation. But just to say, one of the things that I would see a revision of the five pillar strategy, um, one of the, the, the revisions that I would encourage is there needs to be a more holistic approach to how we see and understand reintegration. What do I mean by that? As is, we separate rehabilitation and reintegration, and every time reintegration is mentioned, we think about deported migrants. It is more than that. Reintegration needs to be seen as a process that starts at the point of arrest and continues all the way to post-release, right? So it's a process and not an event. Until we start to treat reintegration as that, then we will continue to talk about deported migrants being the center of reintegration interventions and then miss our target population. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our panelists for their excellent, powerful presentations and the tremendous insights that they've shared, the time that they've shared with us today. And thanks to you for your keen attention. We've heard about the continuity and we're looking forward to the ongoing discussions. We have time if there are maybe three questions and then after that we invite you between today and tomorrow to visit the research village and to also share your contact information with us for future presentations. So if there are any questions now, yes? All right, pleasant good afternoon, ma'am. Right, this question is directed to the minister with the security portfolio. Right, I heard a lot about the crime plan. However, I am of the view that a very important component is missing as it relates to investigations. What is currently being done to bolster the investigative capacity of the JCF as also the investigative integrity of whatever investigations is carried out. Because I have a personal experience where an uh, investigating officer is, is investigating a case and come across some very damning evidence which can set the person who is being investigated free and uh, deliberately neglect same because according to them it is not helping their case. All right. Thank you for the question. Well, first let me just indicate that I, no. I was given 15 minutes and I tried to touch briefly on quite a few topics. It's difficult to outline all the details in answer. The question left were very relevant. One of the critical elements in resolving the, the criminal activity in the country is to convert what we call intelligence, which is a different activity, into evidence that can go to court. And that means strong, capable, highly integrated professional uh, of the highest integrity to investigate having got the intelligence to do it. 
we are aware of it. We are taking some steps. This area where corruption will damage your, your, your whole security efforts, we are also aware of that. And we intend to ensure that we can separate those who have gone beyond the ethical margins from the system. It's not the vast majority, but it only takes a few to ensure damage the whole process. Um, and it also impedes the, the destro destroying of the organized gang, which is a different aspect. The issue that Dr. Gail was, we agree on all of his analysis, but there's another factor which I didn't spend, couldn't spend time going into because a lot of the activity is led by highly successful criminal organizations who have money. So even when you do a lot of what is proposed there, and I have in a community which is one of the highest rate, Montego Bay was maybe Kingston seems like see, but we went to 300, we were at 192 murders per 100,000 last year. But in addition to the behavior problems that we are faced with, there are criminal business organizations that have huge amounts of money. In, in the Western Bloc, money is not a concern, a, a problem for the criminal element. They have more money than the formal economy. And therefore, behavior pattern comes in, but part of it dismantle the organized networks that support the criminal organization. And what you have asked, we are, con we are aware, we are concerned, and we are taking some significant steps to ensure that the country will have an effective, powerful investigative unit that is, has the integrity to dismantle this kind of operation. All right? And we expect to see some results. Some have started. I mean, the DPP did indicate we have 14 gangs, which is still not where we expect them to be, not the top ones, but we have 14 destructive gangs case coming up in jail, coming up this year which reflects some very specialized effort by investigators. It involves over 300 souls, one gang is 29, and others are 10, 15, over 200 individuals involved. That will come up, of course. So work is being done at it, thanks for the question, but rest assured, we recognize it, and we're going to do something about it. And that's, where I, that's why I focus on investment. I, I, I could have spent more time on the, the broad research and philosophies that this government is prepared to put money, as we get the fiscal space, into the security architecture to fight crime in every way. Thank you, Minister. We have another question here on the right. Yes, this is also for the Minister. As we listened carefully to all which was um, being spoken, there is just one interesting thing I have not heard in relation to how prepared is the security, uh, what are the plans put in place for proper rehabilitation for persons who have committed crime because these are the same, some of these persons are the same persons pulling back into crime. That is partly true for the younger generation, the younger criminal element. And there are some pretty good programs in the, what we call the juvenile centers that goes up to age 18. Um, there's a particular program called New Path Program. It's funded by International Fund. It's an excellent program in terms of providing skills. I would say I'm not satisfied with the level of emotional support given, or I, maybe the professional say psychological um, intervention in these centers, and I'm in fact, only recently invited, asked my staff to invite a number of people in skill in that field to come and look at the programs and review that aspect of it. But we, yes, it's one of the things we'd like to significantly reduce is recidivism. But bear in mind, if you look at one of the presentations from Dr. Gale in particular, we talk about relocation, and it's not just physical relocation. There are a lot of young men who will tell you, you know, much of what we say, we all know it, it's just finding the right solution. They'll tell you distinctly, once I leave here with a skill and I go back to the community which I'm in, I have to go back to the gang because that's where I find support and a certain level of love and comfort and respect because we don't show them respect. They come from down there, so he was a dirty boy and he must be a criminal. They apply for a job, they go for an interview, they look at the address, they know they don't get the job. And I've had many like that who in established institutions and some of them have been killed back on the street because they refuse to change the address. And I talk in bright people, not dunce people. 
Yes. Seven I, ones at CXC, A levels, people with university degrees find out to move out of Montego Bay to get jobs and they come back in, they come in for a day and leave. Yes, I, under, I understand all of that. But so what I'm just trying to point out, is there any form of um, place, uh, um, you, is there anything that has been put into place? for the rehabilitation of these persons I'm because saying the young here, 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 here what I'm, I'm saying here I'm is here. that you will find a man who might have committed an offense and he spent say 10 years in prison or say seven years but he's back out and when he comes out is there anything to, there, to a, mentor that I'm person? I'm not sure no. We don't, we don't have a strong mentoring program. We do have a mid-range hostel where they are released into before they come back into the community. So that's reset. It was closed. We reopened it just two months ago. But there is an effort to go there and looking at how we treat those who are incarcerated. Yes, it's part of the program going forward. And I will say as a government minister, to, I will agree with you that it is one of the years that tend to get neglect. Just as in the, in the normal running of the Ministry of National Security and the security, the, the policing of the country, we have tended to provide operational programs rather than look at the strategic development of the program. Each person who has spoken may have a different view of the strategic development, but the truth is that we have not applied the strategic planning and the investment in the security apparatus. And rehabilitation of criminals is one which, have, which was, in fact, shortchanged. Some things are being done. I think the younger people are having, the juveniles have an excellent program, and we are looking at how we can improve for the adults. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Minister. And so we have uh, three, okay. Dr. Taylor, and then question here. Um, it's a quest there's a question at the end of all of this, but there is um, a statement. I'm very vindicated to, by the presentation earlier on, but that hopefully some of you might have seen or heard Georgia Rose from the Department of Sociology, Psychology, Social Work, Western Jamaica campus, and the work of Prof um, Dr. Gale, Professor Clayton, etc. And let's, let's call a spade a shovel. People are not born criminals. And those of us who are in the behavioral sciences have very solid evidence about the kind of antecedents which go into the production of criminals. And so therefore, it is a no-brainer that we need to be focusing on the things to reduce the creation of criminals. So I'm happy that you are exposed to that. But there's a, there are certain kind of social policy implications um, that we kind of shied away from. It is easy for us to talk about the issue of corruption, and indeed, corruption exists in this country and very often we speak about the, of the police officers who have what I like to call corporal tunnel syndrome because they are you know the poster children etc but we have to as a nation and minister attorneys um, policy makers have to recognize that corruption has all kinds of owners and in for any kind of system of justice to work we have to have a commitment that the most powerful persons in the system are going to be abiding by the very same set of rules that they expect the powerless or the least powerful to obey. So as we talk about, you know, things about, such as corruption, etc., it bothers me deeply that we talk about the corruption perception index and each time, you know, we focus on questions about what people think about corruption. I am the only person in media who has, or in the academy who has ever gone to the next page of, the, of the, this, this study coming from uh, Transparency International that talks about the actual examples of people who report that they have paid bribes to particular groups of people, including 12% of Jamaicans who say they have paid a bribe to police officers, 6% who play the, say they have paid a bribe to judges, etc. I ask a question as we talk about trying to keep money from out of the hands um, criminal money from out of the hands of criminals and out of, um, you know, decent society. Is there any attempt, any serious attempt, to properly trace the money that comes from filthy lucre to prevent it from ending up into parliament? One. Two, as regards persons who are in the legal profession, and I speak without any fear whatsoever, in the legal profession, um, I do know that the Procedure of Crime Act 
um, and the other legislation which have to do with money laundering requires that lawyers ask certain kinds of questions, especially when they are intermediaries for the purchase of property, etc. But I'm willing to bet you, and I'm asking the attorneys to help me here and to help me to push this one, do the attorneys themselves have to ask the same kinds of questions about the fees that they collect from what could very well likely be filthy lucre themselves? Because we have to be certain that, you know, when we have the defense attorneys who are doing the things to, you know, um, that they are not being paid by illegal gains, etc. And I think that we need to get the message out as well um, in regard to the issue of um, crime and clear up, etc. Ms. Llewellyn made a point, and I think that we embellish it too often, that the majority of cases that go, come through, that she, she and her colleagues prosecute, which relate to homicide, result in a conviction. Am I right or am I right, ma'am? So, and talk about investigative capacity. Um, that's not where the problem lies. Believe it or not, the Jamaican police have great, very good, above average investigative capacity. The real gap in, the ish in, in, in it is whether or not people, as she said at the beginning of her presentation, and I, and I want her to support me on this one. Right, Paula? That very often, sometime within a, within a week, about 80% of homicides, the police know exactly who it is that did it. The problem is, you don't have the people stepping forward to speak. So that's a big part of the issue. Anyway, I've talked enough. Thank you. I guess I have to pick up on it. You have raised quite a number of issues I have to answer to, but first of all, let me indicate, yeah, we, from the policy point of view, Jamaica has a very good suite of laws to deal with corruption. Um, it's come back now, quite frankly, to the caps to investigate and convict. Um, the Proceeds of Crime Act, FID, in fact, has the authority, which is why it's the Ministry of Finance, to dig up everything that happens in terms of money in this country. And uh, they do so from time to time. From the moment you use money anywhere and large money in any bank in Jamaica, FID can go and find out where it's coming from, why it's coming from there, and how, where you get it, and ask where it's coming from. The Proceeds of Crime Act is being strengthened, but one exists, and quite an effective one. MOCA does a lot of anti-corruption work, and we are confident we have all the people in MOCA vetted and credible, in addition to the police intelligence unit. But MOCA itself is designed to look specifically at corruption. And although, you see, the problem with corruption cases and a lot of the kind of less dramatic cases, because murder is dramatic, you see it in the newspaper and it gets exciting, and the, the, the trial lawyers are quite um, exuberant personalities. If I say so, <laughs> so they make the news. But proceeds of crime, um, FID do a lot of work, and they help to convict. A lot of the gangs going in have associated some of the work done by FID. MOCA has some 331 serious corruption cases coming up, and is doing extremely capable work quietly. And bear in mind, legally, the new Integrity Commission has prosecuting powers. It was only started initially you know, institutionalized this year, which means that when we give in our parliamentary declarations, or anybody else from the civil public sector, go to the Integrity Commission, the Integrity Commission has the right to investigate, and if they're the suspect, they can prosecute. So the laws are there now, it's a question of executing them. I'd like to make one short comment on an issue raised about the, you know, what you do in terms of intercepting criminal at a community level. One of the things we tend to ignore, and I think Dr. Gale alluded, is that there's a mainstream of intervention which we, public intervention, which we tend to avoid. It's not just PMI, CSJP, JSF, and all those. The schools, the health services need to be examined in our less privileged communities. And that is critical. It can make a tremendous difference when you get a school if efficiently organized. And, I'd, and it's, a, that, it's anecdotal, but a fact, I have two schools which got two principals at the same time in two of the toughest communities in Jamaica. Flanker and Glendevon. Glendevon today has become a model school on its principal. And last year, all the students, including the boys, who took the GSAT exam got placed in a high school. The other school still have the boys drop out to go into different kind of activities and demonstrate a failure to really organize the school and move in. Thank God the principal resides this year and we'll look, look for a principal who can deliver. But just to get your school organized, and it will not take 10 years to transform because once the student does well, 
the fathers begin to treat differently. And I meet it daily. If my son doing well at school, I want to see him go to university and therefore I don't want to get killed by a police. It's, it's, a react, it's a parental reaction, but there is that kind of activity out there. Um, we have had a lot of that kind of program out there as well in, in the Constitution. But we have been running in criminal activity in St. James for a long time. I'll discuss it. They'll take the whole day to discuss. Let me um, come back on the uh, money laundering issue. Uh, we addressed this in some detail in the national security policy. And when we were working on it, we looked at, for example, the White House strategy to, uh, for dealing with organized crime and the, um, the anti-mafia strategies in Italy, the Guardia Financia, for example. And we found that there was a very, very clear picture emerged globally. Organized crime finds it difficult and getting increasingly difficult to operate in a pure cash economy. They absolutely depend on having ways to launder the money back into the formal economy. Now, there's some sectors which are known to be particularly vulnerable. Any sector which generates a lot of cash turnover, like, for example, car lots, entertainment events, sales of phone cards, etc. Any business that allows you to have a legitimate reason for having a bag of cash. But there are more sophisticated ways of moving the money into things like construction and so forth. Now, the problem for organized crime is that it's quite difficult to for them to invest in their own name. They need people to act for them. Now, uh, there was a time in which we had people, real estate brokers in this country, who would take payment for a house in cash. We had to close down that loophole. That was a way in which money from typically the lottery scam could be translated into real estate. But the main loophole, it turned out, was attorneys. And there were a few attorneys <coughs> who were hiding behind what's called client attorney privilege, which basically says any um, discussion between an, an attorney and their client is confidential, is privileged. Now, this actually I I was a, an over-interpretation of client attorney privilege. It's been clearly established in other jurisdictions that this only pertains to your discussing with your attorney the actual charges on which you've been arrested and you're going to be brought before the court. It does not cover activities which are themselves illegal. In other words, it does not give the t attorney any exemption. And fortunately, what was happening was that there were a few attorneys in this country, and I can name some of them, but I better not because I don't spend the rest of my life in court or having to wear bulletproof underwear, um, <laughs> who were actually handling major sums in terms of uh, proceeds of crime for their clients. They knew perfectly well where this was money was coming from, but they were not having to disclose it. And they were hiding behind client attorney privilege. So in the national security policy, we actually said this is a loophole. This is not a orthodox interpretation of the law, and it's being used for money laundering. And when and uh, the, the, the lawyers, a small group of lawyers, fought this all the way up to the Supreme Court. And fortunately, the Supreme Court ruled, no, this is, uh, this is an open door to egregious corruption. It is an overextension of the client, uh, idea of client attorney privilege, and this should be closed. Now, um, that, of, of course, left a, lot of, uh, a few very unhappy lawyers. But nonetheless, if we were not prepared to take measures like this, we would never get anywhere with dealing with organized crime. And we don't close down the loopholes which they use to launder money back into the formal economy. They will continue to flourish. It's only when you close all of these loopholes that you leave them exposed and vulnerable to law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. We had indicated a final question here, and then we will close. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to good thank afternoon. the panel. Um, they gave excellent presentations, and my question is quick. How many people are in prison, and how many are coming out each year, on average? We have 1.5 million people of working age. Okay, so 
first of all, you, um, it's important to know that we have correctional facilities, notwithstanding that the conditions of detention are um, in need of improvement. But we have about 3,400 inside the facilities with about 1,600 coming out each year. 3,000? And the minister is adding that um, the men are in the majority, um, 85 females. Oh, so that's a small number then. It's a small number. Um, in fact, Jamaica has the lowest imprisonment rate in the entire Caribbean. That's very, that's very interesting. We can carry it's, on it's this conversation another It's very time. interesting, and indeed it might be as a result of the diversionary mechanisms in place. Um, but yes, it's an area for further research. Highest murder rates and uh, lowest imprisonment rates. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. We invite you to continue the discussions after this to share with Solisis your contact information so that we can continue to share uh, information on the forum and to visit our Solisis booth in the research village. It will be open until 6 today and then reopens at 10 tomorrow. We really would like to thank our panelists and to thank you all for your participation. Uh, we thank our university director, Prof. Henry Lee, for her support of the cluster, and Dr. Dacia Leslie, the chair of the cluster, for organizing. And we're now going to ask Dr. Leslie to share some of our research day booklets with the panelists, and others will be available as you go through the research village. So thank you all again, and uh, we look forward to the continued discussions.